All right, this is the uh, virtual tastings and classes during quarantine. Hopefully the quarantine will be over soon and we can go back to regular service and soon the regular wine classes. But uh, until then, I appreciate the support and everyone logging into these videos to um, to watch, to follow along, to pair with, uh, with our takeout. Uh, again, two wines each week. Videos are free, $40 for the two wines. You get to follow along. Uh, this week, I want to talk to you about tannin. Uh, what do we know about tannin? Basically, a while back, I was uh, watching a Nigella Lawson video on... Uh, she was making uh, bread and butter pudding using croissants. And when she was making her simple syrup, and I make simple syrup for a lot of things myself, especially when I make limoncello or zentorino, what I learned is that uh, you don't stir the pan to break down the sugar into the water to make the simple syrup. And otherwise it'll crystallize if, if you stir it, but you can shake it or whir it about. And she, she said, I'm not a scientist, obviously. So I, I'd like you to bear in mind that I'm a sommelier, not a scientist. So my explanation of tannin is going to be less than scientific for sure. But when it comes to wine, the tannin is, um, well, it's a type of astringent polyphenolic a biomolecule that binds itself to and kind of activates um, proteins, which is why we want to see more tannic wines paired with uh, very bold proteins like steak and the like, um, because that's what kind of sets each other off and balances each other at the same time. But when you see it occurring naturally, you'll see it in grapes and other fruits. You'll see it in some nuts like walnut. You'll see it in um, tea. You'll see it in those kind of things. And basically, it's that, um, that astringent and that uh, bitter character that you start to get. You'll notice it on some of the wines. Some of them will have it, some of it won't. Please don't tell me that a wine is bitey. It's not a dog, it's a wine. So it can't bite you. It's not bitey, it's wine. So it's acidic, it's fruit forward, it's soft, or it's not, or it's astringent. And by astringent, we mean tannic. It's bitter, it's astringent, it's not biting you, okay? Uh, I know we like to laugh about this in the wine classes when uh, when I say we can't use words like bitey, but it's it's the truth. It's not biting you. So um, if we want to we want to taste like a professional, we can start by uh, talking like one. So uh, when it comes to tannins, I chose two more Italian wines this week, but I wanted to illustrate wines, uh, one that is very tannic and one that is not. Now, if we were actually in a real wine class here, I would ask for a show of hands which one feels like this, which one does not. And by a show of hands, usually people are pretty spot on if the wine is very correct because the wine makes it obvious when I choose obvious um, examples. So something like this, I chose two Italian wines for this week. This is wine number one. This is one we're gonna analyze today. This is wine number two. We'll be doing this one probably on Thursday. So this is a Barbera. Barbera is from Piemonte. This is Sagrantino. Sagrantino is from Umbria. One of them is extremely tannic and the other one is extremely not tannic. Today's wine is extremely not tannic. The Barbera is not tannic. You'll see it, you'll feel it when we taste it together. Sagrantino is very tannic. I happen to love very tannic wines. I think we know this based on my um, self-proclaimed fetish for these kind of wines, for Tanat for uh, Alianico, for Sagrantino, for wines like that, for rum, for Bordeaux, for those kind of wines. I really, really like a lot of tannin, but um, something I've discussed with a lot of my viewers and with a lot of my customers and uh, people in the wine classes is that I prefer natural tannin, which is to say something occurring from the grape and not so much from the oak, because sometimes oak can be like a person wearing too much makeup or uh, something very unnatural. Oak has its purpose. It has its purpose, and some wines actually get better with use of oak, which I'm sure a lot of us have learned if we've had any wine in our lives. But some of them become too masked, and you can't perceive the honesty of the fruit, and also you can't perceive the terroir, which is to say the expression um, of the wine's place of origin, which would be the um, the soil, the climate, and its uh, its surroundings. So uh, take a look back on some of the, uh, the other videos for a, a pretty strong explanation of what is terroir. So that said, today we're going to discuss a low tannin wine, and that's why I chose these two. If you want, open them on the same day, but this one, this one's great right out of the bottle. 
Um, it doesn't do any better with, uh, with exposure to air, at least I feel that way. This is something that we like to serve directly out of the bottle. Both of these wines are usually available by the glass at the wine bar. This one since day one, this one since this fall, last year. Um, the Sagrantino, I would strongly advise decanting if you're able. If you don't have a decanter, pour yourself a glass and leave it for a good half an hour. And that's the Sagrantino. But this guy today, this is the Barbera. So what you'll need, pen and paper for tasting notes, your white surface for your background, your bottle, your glass. Okay, let's start. This is a young wine. This is the Pico Macario 2017 Lavignone Barbera di Asti. Okay. The Lavignone is the flagship or most important wine produced by Pico Macario. This is the 2017 vintage. So if you've been watching the videos or following along with me, um, you'll realize that there are things to look for when we look at a young wine and a lot of it will be indicated in how the fruit is showing, um, the focus and the balance of the wine right now, and also the, um, the color variation from the core to the rim, which we'll analyze in a moment. So a bit about the producer, Pico Macario. Pico Macario is named after the older of the two brothers who own the estate. <clears throat> Pico Macario is a Barbera specialist. Most of their wines um, have all to do with Barbera. They make a lot of different types of Barbera, a lot of different grades, different um, spots uh, on, their, on their estate. But this is their flagship. This is the Lavignon. Also, we carry the Rosé here every year. Um, up until 1997, their family was several generations, I think three, four generations working uh, at, their, at their estate, but they sold their grapes off for, uh, for profit. But in 1997, the two brothers, Pico and um, Vitaliano, created their own brand and they kind of work um, separately, but together, uh, which is a common theme these days, separate but together. Uh, at the at the estate. So they each have their own roles, which is very common in family-owned estates. They have their own roles there. They're located about an hour away from actual Asti. So the, the town is uh, the town is um, Mom, Mombaruzzo. Mombaruzzo is the town. It's located just outside of Asti and Asti is located in Piemonte. So when we're looking at Asti, it's in um, south central part of Piemonte. Uh, what they're known for in this area is Barbera and also Moscato. The main grapes of Piemonte are Nebbiolo, named after the fog that descends upon the area. Dolcetto, Barbera. Barbera is also the third most widely planted grape in Italy right now be behind um, Sangiovese and Montepulciano. Uh, elevation here is about 180 meters above sea level. Some of the vines are as old as about 80 years old. So um, you get a lot of concentration in the fruit. You get nice, healthy vine, well taken care of. Um, Piemonte is in the northwestern corner of Italy. There's a lot of mountains in the area. It'll be in the foothills of the Alps and also bordered by the Apennines. So there are a lot of uh, mountains in the area. Also, they're in the river valley of the Po River. So not a lot of the region is suitable for planting grapes and growing vines. Only about 30% of the area is suitable for, uh, for planting to vine. But most of it is Barbera. And so that's, that's kind of the, uh, the lifeblood there. Uh, it's good workhorse grape. It produces very soft wines, very robust fruit forward wines. Um, when you're looking at the, the latitude and long longitude lines, we're looking at something that's pretty uh, even with Bordeaux but there's a very different climate from Bordeaux. Bordeaux is very hot. And um, <clears throat> when we're looking at Piemonte, we're looking at um, something colder, more continental. There's still a fairly warm summer, but there's low rainfall. A lot of this is influenced by, um, by the, the valley, but also by, uh, by the, the mountains. Uh, Barbera has been growing in this area since the 13th century. The soil is uh, mostly clay. And uh, again, they're, they're planted fairly high, but not extremely high. So um, that said, this is, this is a nice young wine. Let's, let's take a look. So again, here's your label. 
So we're not going to discuss tannin until the end, but you're you're going to know what I mean when when you feel it when you uh, when you perceive it. Tannin and acid. Um, let me hearken back to this. Tannin and acid are things that you can perceive. They're not things you can taste or smell. So when I was taking a wine course years ago with uh, famous Kevin Zarelli from Windows on the World at the World Trade Center, I took the course in uh, 2011, I want to say, 2012, something like that. Uh, I think 2012. And I already had my sommelier certificate. I took it kind of for fun after meeting him a few times. And one thing he has you do toward the end of the course is that he has these clear liquids, so you can't really be influenced one way or another by what they look like. And each one of them is changed or altered somehow with uh, different characteristics that you can taste or smell, but mostly what you can perceive. And the most interesting ones to me were acid and tannin. And um, I kind of found my groove with them because for me, the ones that I embrace the most that are right for me, not necessarily right for everybody, but the ones that are right for me are the ones with higher natural grape tannin, kind of like we saw on the um, on the Alianico from last week, but especially on the, uh, the Mataron from the week before. So, like I said, when we discussed tannin this week, and I would love to hear your feedback. Thank you so much for all the feedback, the comments, all the thumbs up I've been getting on the videos and the... Uh, the posts on Facebook and Instagram, and also conversations I've been having with customers. Please keep them coming. It's very helpful to me when I know what to discuss with you, what you're interested in, what you like, etc. cetera. Um, what I'd like to know from you this week after you taste these wines, let me know maybe next week, is which one you prefer because that'll give me an indication of, because these are two such extremes, uh, tannin or not tannin, I'm kind of curious to know what you think because... I haven't really been interacting with customers a whole lot since the lockdown, but I'm looking forward to that changing because I miss you all. So let's take a look with our white background. Let's hold the wine away from us. Remember, hold it over your uh, your white surface and take a look. I see um, a fairly bright red, kind of soft red, not so bright, um, but it is a nice soft red. I would say it's fairly clear, um, not extremely reflective, I would also say take a look at the core. You see the core where it's um, kind of that dark spot in the middle of it. There's not tremendous color variation, is there, from the core to the rim. Remember, the rim is that clearer part that we see where the, the wine is meeting the, uh, the edge of the glass. That usually indicates a fairly young wine. Remember when we said the brickish rim, when we see more color variation from core to rim, that means that the wine is showing its age a bit. Uh, to me, this wine is better consumed young. I like my Barberas young. I like my Nebbiolos old. I think I think most people do uh, once you know more about them, but everybody's different. There's no wrong answer. It's a question of taste. Um, a lot of people really like this wine. A lot of people really like this wine. This has been a mainstay by the glass since opening day, and it always will be as long as I have access to it. This is something that we recommend for a lot of people who don't drink a lot of red wine. People that are just kind of segueing into drinking red because it's so soft, which you'll perceive if you haven't had this wine already over here, which a lot of people have, um, this is something very soft. So this is something that we all like on staff. This is something that goes well with a lot of food. This week, if you caught my posts um, beforehand, I had recommended either the Italian board or pizza with sausage with these wines. Um, I think that they're both good with it for different reasons. I think this is a nice, safe, easy, user-friendly, fun, soft wine. I think that the Sagrantina will be a powerful beast to pair with them. And uh, when we discuss the tannins again, especially with the Sagrantina, we'll be discussing how they bind themselves to the protein and activate it with the natural protein that you see in meats. So I like Sagrantina with meat. I would not pair the Sagrantina with our fish dishes. The Barbera, however, Barbera is very easy. Barbera will go with most of the food on our menu. Um... So take a look. Remember when we said about discussing the, uh, we're not going to say legs, we're going to say the tears. When we give it a good swirl, get a little air on it. But the important thing right now is we want to look for how, um, how it affects the glass in terms of viscosity. And the video cut out from part one. So this will be part one. The other one, this is part two now of the, uh, the Barbera. So um, don't forget this is in two parts. Um, so now we're looking at the viscosity. So take a look, remember, blow a little bit into it and you'll be able to catch where the wine reached the, the glass and where the tears are gonna start. 
So it's not super viscous, but it's also not, um, not it's not less than viscous. It's kind of down the middle. This is 13.5% alcohol. Remember, um, the sun and the heat will drive up the sugar in the grapes when they are converted into alcohol via fermentation in a dry style wine. We're going to see, um, we're gonna see that greatly affected by, uh, by the temperatures and the growing conditions. So here we have something more moderate and uh, this is right down the middle, this is 13.5% alcohol. So the tears should be pretty much down by now. So let's take a sniff. Remember short, quick sniffs, just like a dog to be most effective. Get your nose in the glass. It smells like a lot of fruit, right? A lot of fruit we're catching. This will be mostly red fruit, a lot of, um, a lot of cherry, I would say, a sweeter cherry, not Bing cherry, not tart cherry. I would say this is some um, quintessential cherry fruit. This is red fruit. This is uh, red berries. I would say strawberry jam. I would say raspberry. I think um, true to the region, but also extremely true to the grape. This is a fruit forward wine. We're not catching a lot of spice. We're not catching a lot of salinity or savory notes. I would say some soft floral notes, uh, pink or red blossoms. Now, one of the main reasons that this is not going to appear very spicy, right? You're not catching cinnamon or clove or anything like that on it. That's because of Pico Macario with the Lavignon, that this is a Lavignon. They make this uh, using stainless steel tanks, no oak. So we're not going to perceive tannin coming from oak. We're not going to perceive spice or vanilla notes coming from oak either. Take a taste. What we want to do when we take the taste is to see yes we like it or no but also we want to confirm the characteristics that we smelled again spit it out if you want don't spit it out if you don't want and to me this definitely confirms a lot of the fruit and floral notes um slightly jam notes but definitely no no dry or raisinated fruit it's very fresh um some stewed and some uh very fresh uh, again, I would say the floral notes. Again, you heard me taking in some of that oxygen through my teeth because you, you want to make sure you don't dribble it out on your clothing on the on the surface. But uh, also you want to get the oxygen on it and get it to go back toward your olfactory to activate that. Because when you're tasting, you're tasting like sweet, salty, savory, sour, things like that. Um, you're not tasting cherry. You're not tasting... Um, raspberry or strawberry, that's actually your olfactory kicking in. And um, so that's why when it's on your palate in your mouth, you want to be able to uh, to get your, your nasal senses going as, as well, because the, the aroma actually plays a larger part than the taste, if you want to know the truth. Um, let's go in for it again now, because this is what I really, really wanted to discuss with him. This is about the, um, the fruit, the acid, and the tannin that I'm always uh, breaking down for you in terms of balance. get it to really coat your mouth. There's a lot of fruit, right? It's uh, medium to full bodied, very soft. Um, it's classic style, but there's still a little bit of modern note in that it's um, it's not super dry. The texture is clean. I would say the length is medium. Um, there's definitely a lot of fruit, but there's also plenty of acidity. That's why your mouth is watering a bit. That's why it's a great food wine. It's nice and clean. It'll age pretty well, but it's not intended to be super long aging like Nebbiolo or like uh, Tanat, Cabernet, uh, Syrah, and uh, Sagrantino, which we find out in the next video. Why is your mouth not puckering? Why are you not feeling anything bitter? Why are you not perceiving that? Why is it not drying out? Why is it not astringent? Because the tannins are naturally low. So I felt that these two lines would be a very good illustration for you to understand tannin. If you're opening them at the same time, that'll be even better, but not everyone has the, the fortitude or the interest in opening two things at the same time. But I would find this to be a very easy drinking wine, um, kind of fun, very delicious, and it is a nice food wine. But I chose this specifically to show you what low tannins are all about. Um, if you have any questions on, on our Barbera, feel free to drop me a line, drop me a note couple of days we'll address the Sagrantino and you will be shocked at just how different they are. Some people say to me, and it's a little sad when I hear people say, oh, give me anything. They all taste the same to me. Well, 
it's like reading a book or watching a movie or listening to music. You're not just going to see them all as the same, right? They're not all the same. They're each an individual. And to me, that's the same thing with the wine. They're not all the same, right? So Mignon Blanc doesn't taste like Chardonnay. Chardonnay doesn't taste like Riesling. Riesling doesn't taste like Pinot Grigio. Pinot Grigio doesn't taste like a Verstraminer. And then you look at the reds and there's tremendous variation as well. Uh, again, I think this is a nice, easy entry level red wine. And uh, yeah, we, we love this wine on staff. You see us recommending this all the time. This is one of our best sellers. Uh, so yeah, please keep on supporting us with the takeout program and the, um, the virtual classes during quarantine until we're able to open back up for service. And please pray for a, uh, a speedy resolution to this because the restaurants are suffering tremendously. And when the restaurants suffer, the distributors suffer, the, uh, the wine producers will suffer from this. The sales reps might suffer from this. Uh, people who supply our food, our other products, people who work in the restaurants, and especially those of us who are footing the bill for it, we are suffering from this. So I appreciate your support very much, and I'll appreciate it again when I see you all coming in when we're permitted to open, which I hope will be sooner rather than later. Thank you so much for watching. See you in a couple of days.